Very good. Then good morning. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Uh, we're here on Tuesday, May 26th, uh, right after Memorial Day weekend, uh, on the first day that uh, Governor Cuomo has uh, allowed for the Hudson Valley counties to uh, open up and begin the process of getting back to uh, the new normal. I don't know if it's going to be the old normal, but to the new normal in terms of our economy and our business community. I'm joined by Bridget Gibbons, who's our Director of Economic Development here in the county. And uh, I'm going to go through a lot of things before I bring Bridget on, but Bridget's going to come on and uh, share some of the strategies that she and her team are going to be working on since we're dealing now with two major public policy issues at the same time, dealing with a public health pandemic and dealing with an economic development revival, both of which are important. Uh, both of which have to work in some sort of harmony together. We can't ignore one for the sake of the other. Uh, and at the same time, we have to try to find a balance point. Uh, let me just start out again by thanking Governor Andrew Cuomo for his leadership on this. He's going to be live uh, half past the hour, and he'll be making some announcements. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to keep my comments and this uh, within that time frame. So for those who may watch or who may want to cover the news that he'll make since uh, the decisions that basically govern the state in every region are being made by the governor and his executive team. Uh, he has executive authority to do that and uh, he stepped forward very early on in the contagion to show that it would be a coordinated effort. And what we're having today is we are the, I think, the eighth region in New York State now to uh, quote unquote open up today. Long Island may be very closely behind us and then of course left is uh, New York City, which is very important to those of us who live in Westchester County. Um, let me just give you a couple of quick statistics and uh, before we get into the heart of the reopening situation. Uh, our most recent statistics that track yesterday in Westchester County throughout the course of these months, almost three months worth of the contagion, we have 33,049 people that have tested positive for COVID-19. However, of those number, uh, the far larger number were tested positive in a period of time of two weeks or more. So they have cleared the, uh, uh, the period of contagion uh, and the period of infection. And now the number of active cases are the number of total positives, less the number of people who were diagnosed two weeks ago. So the number of active cases as we have it from yesterday is 1,665. It's very important to see that number as a critical number. The total number of positives are fine. And I'm sure you know as well as I do, many people that have had COVID, that have gone through the period, have uh, never got sick, were asymptomatic or got sick and recovered. And that, that part of, of that uh, group are not part of the active folks we're worrying about. We have 1,665 active cases. The most recent number we have on people who are hospitalized for COVID is 329 hospitalizations. And let me give you a parameter to compare with. The, the number of active cases at 1,665, when we were in our peak period, which was the first week of April, last couple of days of March, first week of April, in Westchester County alone, we had over 11,000 active cases. We had about 15,000 positives, but 11,000 of them had not cleared the two-week period. And so we were dealing with a significant number of people that could have all gotten sick at the same time. We have 3,000 beds in Westchester County, slightly more than that. If a higher cohort of that 11,000 had become sick, then our healthcare system would have been overrun. It was not overrun. The hospitalization numbers at that time were kept down under 15, down around 10%. And so we managed to take, we managed to deal with the spike, the, the, the flattening of the curve, which we heard so much about a month ago. So in the seven weeks that have gone on, now we're approaching eight weeks from the first case and the beginning of that explosion of cases, we now drop down from 11,000, 12,000 cases active to 1,600 cases. Big, big drop. We also have had a big drop in hospitalizations. At one point, we were about 1,200 people hospitalized for COVID in the county, below the capacity of 3,000, but still at 1,200, a very, very big number. That number by our most recent count is 329 people hospitalized for COVID. So as you can see, that's a drop of something to the tune of 75% of all the people that were hospitalized. Now, 329 people is still a lot of people, and, and we still want to see as many of them, all of them, be released and be healthy again. Uh, we have had 1,343 fatalities since the 1st of March for COVID. The first person who, who contracted COVID in the county, the index patient, gentleman from New Rochelle, survived. And everybody that was infected in that original cohort, none of them lost their lives. But the lives lost have come subsequently to that to other people who contracted the disease and, uh, and were fatal. And the heavy percentage of those fatalities, the 1,300 people, are people 60 years of age and older. That's 85% of all the people that died 
were 60, 60 years of age and older. 65% of the people were 70 years and older. So this clearly hit demographically people of a certain age and with some comorbidity. We thought that the people that were most subject to this would be people that had COPD, people that had asthma, people that had respiratory diseases. What we found out is that the comorbidity was much greater with people with diabetes, with hypertension, with uh, other types of illnesses. So this disease has not exactly followed a roadmap and since there is no vaccine and there is no antiviral treatment for when you have the disease, this has been something that uh, medical science has had to work with on an ongoing basis in real time. It's the first time our generation has seen a contagion like this be this uh, widespread and this potentially deadly uh, as uh, COVID has turned out to be. The uh, important part in terms of the fatalities, we have lost, roughly speaking, single digit numbers of people the last number of nights. Now you lose anybody and that's a tragedy. To the people who related to that loved one, it's a serious loss of life. But to lose three people a night, to lose six people a night, compares to, in our peak period, losing 45 people a night. And then the next night, 50. And then the next night, 38. That is a tremendous concentrated loss of civilian life that we have never experienced in recent years in this county. And we're one county. This applies to the region and to the state at large. So in very general terms, we have come down dramatically over the last seven weeks. And as we approach now this opening phase through the metrics that the governor has established, Westchester has been able to manage the disease very well. Nobody controls this disease. Only a fool would act as if the actions that we have can control something because you don't have the vaccine, you don't have the antiviral. If you had that and you could administer them broad-based and you knew that people wouldn't get it and you thought that if they did get it, there was a treatment that over a certain period of time they'd be healthy, then you'd have a sense of some control, but you don't. You're managing it and managing it is why we wear masks. Managing is why we have social distancing. This isn't an effort to change people's life for control. That's one of the most bogus arguments out there. This is simply for public health purposes. The day this virus is behind us, we put our masks away in the, in the, in the closet, hope we never have to pull them out and use them again. And uh, we go back to the normal way we interact as a society. But that really won't happen yet. That's not what we're doing today with the opening of uh, the Hudson Valley region. Let me, let me remind you, Westchester is part of a region of seven counties. We are not acting alone. We uh, are not being opened by ourselves. We're being opened with statistics that involve all seven counties. So whatever numbers I have that I've just given you only represent the Westchester story, and you have to uh, leaven that with what's happening in the other seven counties. We're the largest part of the region. We represent 41, 42 percent of the region, so it's a significant piece of the region, but it is not all of the region. And there are certain metrics that Westchester's uh, strength and size has helped contribute to qualify for this opening today. We have tested, uh, as of yesterday, to date, 141,483 people. 141,000 Westchester residents represents 14% of our population. There is no geography, there's no jurisdiction that's tested that high a percentage of their population. You'll hear statistics like tested 2% of all Americans or maybe 5% of the people in a state somewhere in the nation. This is 14% of Westchester County has been tested. And those, those testing numbers are, the, are by far the most robust that helps us qualify under that metric. We've, we've never been any jeopardy in that particular metric. Also, the size and scope of Westchester's healthcare system has enabled us to satisfy two additional metrics, total number of hospital beds available and total number of ICU beds available. We turned over Westchester County Center for that purpose. We took a, an arena that we had just used to play a basketball tournament and we turned it into an interim health facility, a hospital with hospital beds. Those available beds there are now part of what can be used should there be a surge or should there be a lack of beds in another part of the region. If people from the city uh, need to be hospitalized, if people from elsewhere in the Hudson Valley or beyond need, uh, need a central place, that, that has now been made available by what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the State Department of Health has done with a county facility which we've turned over to them. As we have turned over Glen Island, the testing facility. Now, we did that well over two months ago. Uh, people didn't think much of it. Now, we've turned over our biggest beach in the county, during the summertime season to the state, and we've made it uh, pretty much impossible for people to enjoy Glen Island for its original purpose because it was this county's contribution to the battle against COVID, as is the county center. So uh, where we stand right now uh, in terms of all of these different metrics, 
The state has indicated that the Hudson Valley as a region has met all those metrics. The issue of contact tracing has been sort of the last metric that has to be hit. Uh, the governor uh, had identified that we needed to have in the region 1,991 people uh, identified as contact tracers. My understanding is Westchester's contribution to that total was uh, helpful and is not completed yet, but we identified well over that number. Uh, individuals going through training and then now being prepared to start the process of contact training uh, this very day here in Westchester and I gather in the other six counties as well. The governor will certainly announce whatever statistics he wants to announce, but from our standpoint, Westchester has done its job. We've identified people to be able to perform in that function. We're working with the Bloomberg Initiative to do that. And I want to publicly thank Joan McDonald, our Director of Operations, Emily Saltzman, our Deputy Director of Operations. They worked uh, all weekend long and for weeks before that to help make this happen. Uh, we've had Dr. Sharlita Amler, our Commissioner of Health, and a host of other people within that organization that have done a terrific job so that we can have the contact tracing process happen. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So today is, uh, is the beginning of phase one. It is not the beginning of the end. It's probably, as Churchill said, the end of the beginning. When we, uh, as we reopen today, we've satisfied the seven metrics, which include decline in total hospitalizations, decline in deaths, new hospitalizations are at a certain limited level, hospital bed capacity, ICU bed capacity, diagnostic testing capacity, and contact tracing capacity. And all of those different elements look to how we would handle any surge that might yet come. So we're tracing, we're tracing contacts, we're testing people for COVID, we're making sure there's enough beds available if they're needed in the ICU level as well, and we're watching metrics that show that there's a limited number of new hospitalizations, there's a decline in net hospitalizations, which we have, the 329 number that I gave you uh, has steadily gone down over the last um, uh, seven weeks, and that also there's a decline in deaths. And in deaths, uh, we're talking about the overnight fatalities, how many people uh, do we lose in a given night, and is that number lower than where we were a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Now, we're going to be announcing before the end of the week uh, our reopening task force here in Westchester County. Uh, uh, Bridget Gibbons, who's going to be speaking to you, is going to be one of the key people on that, but we'll be back for a press conference to announce the members of it and Bridget's role and other roles in order to helping us do it. The contact tracing piece uh, which was the last piece, is also the one that the county has the most direct control and responsibility for. We want to give a shout out to Karen Pecora, who is the head of our uh, unit of CSEA, Civil Service Employee Association Union. That's the largest union of employees in Westchester County. She's been very critical in helping us identify contact tracers from within our workforce that would be able to do this function. And, uh, and uh, the vast majority of them, having been trained, are ready to go on day one to start to deal with new cases as they begin today. That's the way it was structured. Once you open, all the new cases going forward are the ones that have to be tested and traced. The way it works is that the state will notify the county health department of the positive cases. The state gets all the testing information. They provide to the, to the county, through the Department of Health, a list of the individuals that uh, have tested positive from this point forward. Uh, they uh, then have the county representatives, our, our tracers, uh, call the individual who are positive. And this, by the way, is not a new task force. That is exactly what our Department of Health was doing at the very beginning of this contagion. And when we started out and the numbers were very low, we had, you know, a dozen or so, or uh, uh, 25 or 35 people, we were able to manage that process within our health department. Once the numbers started to reach the point at which they do now, 33,000 people, that wasn't possible for our health department to do that. But the county uh, health department calls the person who's tested positive and asks them health-related questions only. This is very important because this now opens the door for people who might scam. Someone who calls and says, I'm calling on behalf of contact tracing, I want your social security number. No contact tracer will ask you for financial information or personal information. They will verify your date of birth, your date of birth and your address to make sure that it is the you that it has been tested as positive. And from that point on, all of their questions are health-related questions. Do you have symptoms? How are you feeling? Have you taken your temperature? Things of that nature. That's what the purpose of this is. It is not to get any other information. And I caution everybody, and we're going to work through our Consumer Protection Department and through the State Attorney General Department to make sure that any scams that come out of this, which could easily happen, there's always unscrupulous people looking to take advantage of a situation that this doesn't happen. So the person calls, we ask about symptoms. And if the person is symptomatic, uh, then uh, we have to be able to deal with the need that they may have for health additional. Do they need to isolate? 
Do they need medication, food, location? If you have an individual who's in a private home, single family house, isolation, if you've tested positive, is one thing. If you live in an apartment, and maybe with other people in it, uh, that's a completely different challenge. And some folks may not be able to isolate, tested positive, you're isolated from that situation. The contact tracing starts then, and the contact tracing function will try to identify all the people that that person has come in contact with. So, you know, George Latimer tests positive. Who are the people I've come in contact? The workforce here on the ninth floor is six, eight, ten people. The place that I stopped to get a cup of coffee in the morning, who do I interact with there? Uh, did I talk to the guy when I guessed up my car this morning? Who's that person? Uh, a couple of my friends that I might have gotten together with, maybe we took a walk or we, I went over to his house and we watched football, well, no, it was no football, watched some, uh, you know, soccer from Europe on TV. Something that we might, have, that's how we identify these people. And you identify those individuals and then those people are called to determine what their situation is. Now there's a difference legally between being quarantined and being isolated. Isolation is a legal responsibility of a person who's tested positive. Quarantine is not a legal obligation, but candidly, it's a moral obligation. If you think you were exposed, if I was too close to Ty on that last interview, and I may have exposed him, then he may be symptomatic or not symptomatic, but he may still be contagious and he could contage everybody else. And so, uh, he has to know that he's had contact with the problem, not positive, by the way, so can relax, but um, he, that he needs to know that he may have had con uh, contact with a person who was positive and then take appropriate measures not to potentially infect other people. He may go and get a COVID test himself, find out he's negative, and then he's good to go. This process goes over the 14-day period of time of the incubation. So the, the person being asked these questions has to look back over who was I interacting with for the last 14 days. And then uh, this, this is a, a significant responsibility of detective work. And each of the contact tracers are gonna have a number of people to be able to have to go through to find out those information. Um, then as we reach the point of what happens in the opening process, we're doing this contact tracing, it's going onward. So now we've reached a point where the contagion is, has been dropping and all these major indicators, so now we're ready to uh, reopen business. The governor has laid out a plan that has four phases to it, and, and in sequence do we open. So today we open the first phase of that plan. That phase one involves primarily for this area construction, manufacturing, retail delivery and wholesale trade. It also involves agriculture, forestry, hunting, fishing. Those things are not really major Westchester realities. There's a little bit of everything in the county. But in the main event, this opens construction industry. So all of the cranes that you've seen that had to stop because they were not considered essential construction projects, those get restarted. And the men and women that work on those projects, the carpenters, the plumbers, the electricians, they go back to work. They go back to work. And the developers who are into deep finance and financing whatever their construction is, they can start to move toward a new reopening date with construction. Very important to get those people back into work off of uh, whatever type of unemployment benefit they are, back into the workforce. It opens up manufacturing. There's a host of different areas for manufacturing. Uh, Westchester County does not have, as some counties do upstate, one single big factory, one single big manufacturing industry. Uh, but we do have a lot of small manufacturing businesses all over. If you go down Sawmill River Road and Nepperhan Avenue in the urban part of Yonkers, you'll see a lot of businesses like that. If you go on the south side of Mount Vernon, down South Fulton, South Columbus Avenue, you'll see businesses like that on the main drags and then interspersed. They may hire as little as 10, 15 people, maybe 35, 40 people. Those people get to go back to work today. And again, uh, most of those are folks in, in blue collar industries, uh, they have certainly been hurting for money. The small businesses have been hurting. And so now hopefully this all restarts that process. Uh, there's retail delivery curbside, which is sort of analogous to what you've experienced so far with the, uh, the essential businesses that have had curbside delivery. Pharmacies come to mind, other businesses. And then also uh, food takeout, where you order, you go and you pick up the food. Many times it's set up outside. They'll have, you know, on a, on a table, the bag with your name on it. You pick that stuff up as you go. The, um, the retail delivery is a way to start the process of the retail business back into business, but it will be two weeks at, at the earliest in which full retail will open under phase two. But this is important now because the retail entity can bring back some, if not all, of the staff. And you can call and order something and then go and pick it up in person. You don't have to wait for it to be delivered to you, uh, particularly if it's a store in the community. And, you know, you have people that go to a certain store, they shop regularly, they buy certain types of things, uh, and they can buy it and pick it up 
in the community that day, and it restarts the the retail engine. And it hosts, uh, it involves things, you know, that, that we don't normally think of, not just clothing stores, but floral stores, um, jewelry, luggage, leather goods, lawn and garden equipment, electronics, a host of different things that, that go back into uh, the business we go on. Uh, so those are the those are the primary areas, retail, curbside, manufacturing, and um, con uh, construction that are, that are phased back in today, phase one. It's all throughout the region. We continue the contract tracing. We continue to show numbers that decline or stabilize, as I've just described up front. We continue to show that through the seven county regions, and then we're able to go to phase two. Phase two allows us to open up all professional services. This would be the back of the house, corporate offices, uh, real estate offices, um, finance, law, uh, IT, local governments, county governments, administrative personnel, all those folks can come back to work in phase two. And you also open up professional services, accounting services, things of that nature, and you open up all retail. So your shopping malls and your downtown businesses open up. Chambers of Commerce are waiting for this. The major retailers are waiting for this in phase two. I believe we're going to go through phase one pretty effectively. I think that the construction and the manufacturing organizations will be able to manage their workforce in a way as to keep them safe. And we don't see the contagion spread. That's the mission here, so that it doesn't spread during phase one, we go to phase two. Down the line, phase three is restaurants and food services. Phase four is arts, entertainment, recreation, education. Think of the big events that are coming up and so forth. Um, the phases are gonna last at least a minimum of two weeks. We're gonna have to show that, uh, again, the numbers work, and I think we will. Now, Bridget Gibbons, who's patiently been standing there, uh, has been our Director of Economic Development, or Deputy Director initially when we hired her. She has done a terrific job in a host of different areas. She's been the creator of an incubator program called Element 46. Uh, members of her team, Shari Asher, who works with her, has served as a liaison to local chambers of commerce. Uh, Deb Novick, who's just joined on board, has been a part of this in terms of the IDA, Industrial Development Agency funding, uh, Local Development Corporation funding, which helps not-for-profits. And so she's been at the center of a lot of these activities. And she will be one of the point people, as I said, we'll announce this a little later in the week, uh, that will help us with this economic uh, reinstitution of our things. So Bridget, I'd like you to come share a few thoughts, and then I'll wrap it up with a couple of other points, and then we'll go to questions. Great. Bridget Gibbons. Thank you, George. Um, I, I want to focus, uh, the county executive mentioned that we are entering into phase one of the reopening. And I just want to stress uh, for our businesses out there that are ramping up for this reopening that there are many things that they need to do to prepare. Um, the state has provided very, very detailed guidance on what needs to be done at each workplace. And um, businesses, if they plan to reopen, they need to take care to follow the detailed guidance that has been provided by the state. Um, if, if businesses are not sure where to find the guidance, they can go to um, forward.ny.gov slash industries dash reopening dash phase. And there's detail by industry, there's detailed guidance that the businesses need to follow. So construction has its guidance, manufacturing has its guidance, uh, retail uh, delivery and in-store and curbside pickup. Uh, there's very detailed guidance. For example, um, employers need to provide PPE for their employees at no cost, so they have to provide face coverings at no cost. They have to post social distancing markers in their stores, on their construction site, so that people have a visual cue as to how far six feet is and how far they need to stay away from each other. Um, businesses should prohibit non-essential visitors. That doesn't mean customers, that just means visitors that don't really have to be there. Um, the b businesses must limit sharing of object, objects, such as tools, cash registers, all of those things that are kind of day-to-day -day business. If, if you can isolate a tool to one particular worker, that's good. If workers have to share tools, then they should wear gloves, and the gloves should be provided by the employers. Um, the the employer must also keep a log every day of everyone that enters their place of business, so that includes employees, visitors, um, and and really that that is their that is their place in the whole contact tracing uh, process. So if the employer is keeping track of all the employees that are coming in, all of the uh, other folks that happen to be coming for whatever reason, then then that really facilitates contact tracing should someone uh, test positive, um, and so. Really, the um, after, uh, yeah, um, so and and they also need to keep a log of 
um, if, if they should be doing screening of their employees as the employees enter the facility. So they should be asking them questions. You know, have you been exposed? Have you tested positive? Are you symptomatic? And that should be kept in a log on a daily basis. So every employee that comes in, you're going to ask them questions. It's optional to take their temperature, but you're really going to need to keep a log of every employee that enters and their status on a daily basis. And if someone tests positive, they alert you that they've tested positive, you immediately send them home and notify the state. Um, and so the businesses must uh, take a close look at that guidance that's provided, and, it, uh, um, and once they read it through, they have to affirm that they've actually read it and they're going to implement it. So at the bottom of the page, there's a, an affirmation that gets submitted to New York State. Um, in addition, um, businesses are encouraged to develop a business reopening safety plan, and there's a template provided on the website, the New York State website also, and that is a great checklist um, and to facilitate the business putting together, following the guidance that's been put, uh, given by the state. It's something like, who's going to be doing the uh, questioning, uh, you know, monitoring of the employees as they enter? Who's keeping the visitor log so that we know who's been in our, in our store? Um, so it's really important that businesses take a very close look. It's a little daunting. They're sometimes 10 or 11 pages long, the guidance, but it's really, really helpful. And it'll make sure that if something does happen in your location, you have backup documentation, you show that you're following the rules that the state put forth, and you've done everything you can. Um, and there's also, if a business is concerned or questioning whether they're allowed to open, there's a tool that they can look up. It's businessexpress.ny.gov. And you enter your county, and then you're going to enter your business NAICS code, and it very quickly comes back and says you are eligible to reopen or you're not. Um, so that will help a lot of businesses that are kind of wondering where they fit into this four-phased reopening. Um, and I just do want to mention, you know, the county executive mentioned that we um, are forming this uh, business reopening uh, task force and we're looking forward to getting that launched. And in addition, uh, the Economic Development Department is putting together a mentoring program to help our businesses that need help kind of pivoting in this uh, to the new normal, either from a business plan perspective or, you know, a funding perspective. So we will, once the, the details of that program get worked out, we'll, we'll make another announcement. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bridget. And uh, as I said, we're going to have some additional announcements a little later this week that's going to highlight exactly where we are in implementing some of these programs. Keep in mind that the state governor has established the standards by which we open and also the standards by which we're all supposed to function, not just the county government, but all the other different levels of government. Our role as a county government, working with the local government, is to help implement that which the state has established. We don't get the authority to make the decision, do this or don't do this, but we try to figure out how to happen, how to make this happen so that the businesses can open and they can operate in a, in a productive way. Just going to mention one other thing before we go to questions. Um, the county has maintained control over our county park system. We've talked about this a fair bit over the last uh, few months. And uh, over the past weekend, we opened up two of our beaches, Playland Beach and Croton Point. Point Park Beach and both of those uh, function pretty well this weekend now it was not a great beach weekend as beach weekends go it wasn't 85 degrees and uh, sweltering so we didn't get the demand uh, that we might have had on Memorial Day weekend we were closed on Saturday because of the rainstorm uh, but we intend to reopen this weekend Saturday and Sunday and our uh, our team is looking at how it operates we're going to make a series of decisions many of them over the course of this week uh, and we'll certainly try to announce those on different days as well as we make other announcements we have to decide, and I think we're getting very close to deciding, what the future this year of Playland Amusement Park is going to be. We've already announced that we would not open it any sooner than July 20th, and that presumes that the governor would lift his executive ban on opening amusement parks. But regardless of whether that, is open, that ban is lifted or not, we have to decide if we think we can actually operate it this year or not. We have to decide what we want to do with Playland Pool. That is one of five public pools that Westchester County operates. And uh, Playland Pool is a little bit different because we've already set aside money for its reconstruction through the Board of Legislators. It was part of our uh, Playland Improvement Plan, uh, apropos of the issue of where we're going with Playland in the future. And uh, we're going to have to decide this week if we think we're going to start that construction project sooner rather than later and determine that the Playland pool as an individual pool will be out of, the, uh, uh, out of the mix or not. Of the other four pools, we're going to look internally uh, to determine can they be managed in the way that we manage the beaches. A pool is different from a beach, uh, and the, the way people cluster is different. And if we feel that we can administer them or we can't, we'll make some announcements about what we plan to do with our pools. They normally open the last weekend in June, but that's pivoted on 
when kids are home from school. Kids are home from school now, so we can make some decisions now and determine uh, what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. And that would also apply to uh, our keeping open uh, the two beaches, because normally we open beaches on the weekend in the month of June, and then we open it full time once kids are out of school. Same scenario, kids are out of school now. We'll make some decisions. We closed the Croton Gorge Park this weekend, as did the state there, state version that is adjacent to it, because we could not manage the volume of people that were coming through there. And the physical layout, if you've ever been to it, it's a gorgeous location, but uh, there's, there's nowhere near sufficient parking. They park on uh, one of the state routes that's right by the area. They, they create a potential hazard for emergency vehicles going through. And um, we had to close it this weekend. And now we're going to discuss whether or not we open it, if so, under what circumstances, or if we, uh, if we keep it closed, because we can't manage demand. I said this very early on. Whatever we had to park, that for whatever its physical logistics, we could not manage the demand and be able to create the right kind of social distancing, then we wouldn't keep it open. Um, and that's how we've made these decisions. You know, we've opened golf courses in sequence. They've gone fine. I looked at a couple of them this weekend. No problem at all. Uh, Bicycle Sunday is normally off on Memorial Day weekend, so it didn't occur yesterday or Sunday, but it did occur the three prior weeks. There was, you know, there's a certain amount of masking that we still need to have and a certain amount of social distancing, but to the greater extent, it was well received and people to the greater extent were following uh, the rules. So that's, that's on the things we've done. We've already announced that uh, we're not going to have fireworks on July 3rd and July 4th. And we're now looking at announcing as part of whatever we do with Playland that we may not have fireworks at all this season. That's something we're going to discuss and have a formal announcement about it. If we do, we will probably have, if, if everything permits, a, a closeout of the summer Labor Day fireworks display. That's about as good as we think we can get it if the contagion continues to drop over the course of the next three months that take us from today until Labor Day. But uh, we've not made any firm decisions on that. That's yet to come. But how we handle each of these things, the ethnic festivals and so forth, all depends on the spread of the contagion. We know we need to have the society open at some level for people to have refreshment and, and, and commerce. But we also have to monitor the way that the infections are going. So with all of that, I'm going to stop the narrative. That's uh, a fair bit for one day. We'll have more information later in the week. And we'll open it up to any questions. First, the folks who are here in the room and then anybody who may have uh, uh, communicated with us online. Is phase one in effect as we speak? Yes, began today. It's, it seems to involve a lot of uh, self-policing. Is, is that the plan? And how, how do you guys get involved? It's hard to monitor whatever you yeah. Well, the state has tasked local governments with the, with the enforcement of all of these executive orders, and that is not an easy task. It depends on the particular order that we're dealing with, and that's why when we reach a point where we don't feel we can enforce mask wearing and social distancing, then we close a facility because it's just there's too many people beyond our capacity to respond. That's what we did at Croton Gorge, and we've, we've left that as a possibility in other places just because of the physical logistics of the place. Our Parks Department is the first line of interaction with people, and our county police is the second line of interaction. We don't want to arrest anybody, and we don't want to ticket anybody if we don't have to. We think that the, the purpose of having these masks, they're not ideological, they're not about politics, they're about public health. That's why you have one, and that's why I wear one when I'm not speaking in this context. So uh, to ask people to put masks on, we have seen more compliance week over week. You know, go back three, four weeks ago, you know, you could probably argue it was about half of the people. I think now it's somewhere in the six, 70% range of people wearing it. But it's not universal. You know, you have certain demographic groups. I don't want to finger them, but, uh, you know, people of a certain age just don't think it affects them. Don't do it. Or the majority of them don't do it. And then you also have people who have an ideological pushback. They don't want to do it for other reasons. And uh, we're not looking for confrontation, but we need to have as much compliance as we can. The burden is on us to enforce it in county parks. It's on us to enforce it where we have uh, policing responsibilities. We have a contract to police in Mount Kisco, so we're the local police in Mount Kisco. We have to enforce it there. And so do the other local police departments. And, and every police officer makes a decision, um, uh, and every uh, desk sergeant and, and the people involved in hierarchy make a decision about how best to allocate resources. Are you going to take these people and put them in parks? Or are you going to have them do the normal rounds? Are you going to have them interact whenever there's some sort of a crime situation break out? It depends on the community. But it is up to us to enforce it. We're enforcing it right now firmly but lightly, meaning that we intend to let people know that they need to be socially distanced. We lay out the beach so that it can be that way. Depending on the demand, it's easier or harder to do. The more people that show up, the harder it is to maintain it. At some point in time, we shut off capacity. 
and we don't know if we have you know many more people on the outside trying to get in and what that represents for uh, you know uh, sort of the the, the civil uh, agreement in society but basically um, it, it's it's a, uh, a touch and go scenario how how it works in a particular situation the judgment of the employees there the certainly the police officers are, are trained to handle these situations Parks Department employees have training of a certain sort, but they're not trained to be police officers. And, you know, we want to try very hard to get people to do that. What we're not going to permit is what I see on TV, a Lake of the Ozarks uh, swim party where nobody has a mask on anywhere. People are clustered close together. We see that. We shut that down, you know, because that is clearly going to spread the, the, the virus. And uh, in those situations, all I can say is that people have to grasp we're in a unique situation. Um, hopefully they can understand it, but if they can't, then we close an event or an activity down. And, and that's what we'll have to do, and that's what we'll do going forward. But in terms of the individual businesses, how do you police that? Is it, you know? Well, I, I, think, I think the policing work goes as it does with every other law, which is that, you know, uh, the, the police function, the county police function, and the local police function goes about their rounds. And as they see examples of things being broken, then they respond to them. If they see in a parking lot there's a line outside of a store then uh, that, that isn't spaced out, that means that the people in the store haven't implemented some of the things that Bridges talked about, then the police are empowered to go and speak to the manager, direct the manager to do certain things. Ultimately, because the governor gave us the authority, we could shut the store down if we had to. We don't want to do that. And I think most of the businesses right now have been out of business for such a long time that they want to get the revenue to come in, that they're willing to do these things. There's one other element when we're dealing with businesses. There is a revenue and profit margin for them. So it's not just do what we tell you to do because it's the right thing to do. It's do what we tell you to do if you want business to come in the door. Because aside from the fact that you might see a cluster of people around the front door and they want to get in the store, the next potential customer comes along and sees that cluster and doesn't want to be part of it and doesn't shop. And so they lose a percentage of their business. And I think in a kind of like Westchester, they lose a large percentage of their business. I sort of heard this anecdotally. Somebody said, I went by such and such a place, you know, an essential business. The line was so long. and There were so many people. I don't want to be bothered with it. And, and I think business people will understand that in order for them to get the maximum consumer response, which is what they want to get the revenue in, then they're going to have to do stuff like this in order to manage it so that the person who's a little afraid about going out there will come out and will go to their business. Because if you don't do it, you won't get the business, you know, and that's part of the equation too. So that's the self-policing aspect of the economy and the sort of the invisible hand of the marketplace, as I was taught a long time ago. Other questions from any other folks? Yes. So you mentioned that You know, I don't have a percentage. Uh, I think uh, what you've seen in certain pockets of the county, it's certainly true in New Rochelle and Yonkers. Uh, there's, there's some tremendous construction going on. White Plains always has building cranes. If you walk out the door, you'll see projects to the left and to the right. Now, not all of them stopped because some of them were able to qualify as an essential project for whatever reason. You're building uh, a wing in a hospital, and that's essential, as opposed to I'm building, you know, 12 units of housing. You know, that would be nice to build. But uh, you also see small level constructions in certain areas as well. And this area was booming. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all you know, follow the concepts of transit-oriented development. I don't know how much transit people are going to be on, but um, transit-oriented development, people will build near train stations so they could commute into the city. And they would pay prices for residencies, uh, apartments, and so forth, condos, that would be less expensive than being in Manhattan and close enough to the city via the Metro North uh, commuter train. So that construction is what's going to jumpstart back. So I don't have a percentage for you, but I would say, as I said in my prepared comments, this starts to employ a particular element of the society, the business trades people, folks who work with their hands. Um, if they're unionized or even non-unionized, they're, they're getting a certain uh, level of compensation that's, that's very important to them. And while much of our economy is a service-based economy, and you won't see the benefit of that until you start to open restaurants and bars and things of that nature, um, the, the, the blue-collar element that's reflected in manufacturing and in construction is a very important part of the Westchester economic scene. My mom and dad were blue-collar workers. They worked with their hands, and uh, they would have been off working. My mom worked in small factories on McQuestion Parkway in Mount Vernon. And today, those factories would be back working, and my mom would be back you know, at her station with her equipment doing the things that she would do. And so th that, those are the people that come back. And if we do need to get some statistics for you, I guess you can, I can make, talk I'd to like Bridget. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, please, if you can. Um, in, 20, in 2019, the Westchester County IDA incentivized $1.6 billion in projects. So many of those projects are were in the works, and so they're, they would have been on hold. So we're, it's a very large percentage of uh, you know, the, the economy here in Westchester, and we're really looking forward to them those projects restarting. Okay, other questions? Other questions from in the room? You have some uh, online. Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications. Peter Cass says, we've seen a video of people around the country ignoring social distancing and other measures, including some businesses opening without regard to restrictions. How will reopening of Westchester be monitored? You already, you already touched on this, but he wants yeah. to greater elaborate if there are provisions for enforcement of, the, of this. Well, uh, you know, I did indicate, you know, the police structure and, and how we would work it. I, I think the important thing, Peter, that differentiates what you see on television and what you see here in Westchester County, we were ground zero for the beginning of the infection in the East Coast. We got the first 100 cases here in Westchester County, and we reached a per capita peak that we're at, you know, 33,000 uh, positive cases. A lot of the places that we see, I, I referenced the, uh, the pool party in the Lake of the Ozarks, which is Missouri. Uh, we, we heard the Arkansas governor talk about a, a high school swim party in Arkansas that led to infections. In many parts of this country, they have not seen the increase in infections and they haven't seen the deaths that we have. And because we've seen those things here, I think that is, that is a strong indicator of how people are going to respond to it. So I think you're going to get a more responsible treatment. That's why I think you have 70% of the people, 75%. You know, it's a moving target. You walk down the street, you see who you see. On any given, you know, trip, it might be 50-50 or 40-60. But if you calculate over the course of a day, I think you, the numbers are going to be much higher than that with masks on and with social distancing. You see people of long time friendships giving the elbow, or the air elbow, whatever you know is the, the de rigueur thing to do. You may not see that in other parts of the country because they just haven't been affected by it. I hope they never do get affected by it the way we did. But I do fear that there is a certain lack of you know, concern because it hasn't touched them. And I also think you, know, you have to remember the time we're in. This is the springtime. Uh, people want to get out of the house after being cooped up for the winter. This is graduation season for people of a certain age, whether it's high school or college, there's an exuberance. I went through that for both high school and then later for college. And uh, many of the pictures that I see on television are young people that are going to the beach in Florida or wherever they're going, California. Uh, and, and they're exuberant this time of the year. And because of the statistics that I shared about how many people have suffered fatality and it skews to people of a certain age to the greater extent, although there are many examples of younger people uh, succumbing to COVID, uh, there can be a disconnect. The disconnect is, uh, well, it's not going to affect me, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to happen to me. And, uh, you know, that may be a general reality. And I don't think I was any different when I was 22 or 18 that I thought that I was pretty much indestructible. You think about things as you get older, and, you know, it, it affects you differently later in your life. But I think that's what you're reacting to when you see certain things. And I might say this, I don't mean this is to be a negative to the media, but, you know, we'll see a particular video and it looks compelling. And you'll see that particular video repeated so often that you think it's 100% of the people that are doing what you're seeing in the video. And I don't know that that's always the case, but it's an interesting visual, so you wind up having it repeated over and over again. That's the only question I have. Only question. Any other questions in the room? Yes. But well, we're looking right now, uh, Bridget and her team, Joan uh, and the people that report through operations, at different strategies. We've sent a letter to the state asking for permission to use some of the money that we have uh, from the IDA, Industrial Development Funds, uh, to use for uh, zero-cost loans, small loans to small businesses. Uh, we would need authority from the state to do that. Uh, we've looked at what Nassau County uh, announced that they have as part of a plan, and we're seeing if we can adopt the same thing. We've also looked at the uh, flexibility of federal money that's been made available, and, and can money that's been made available to the county, is that a source that we could use 
to incentivize businesses in certain areas. And, you know, you raise like the example of buying PPEs. That, that may be a, a legal use of it or not. I don't know. We're going to check into it. Uh, but if it is something that's possible, then Bridget and her team of people will be able to help and do that. I think the important thing to recognize is, as a government, we don't intend to do for business what they can do best for themselves. I come out of a corporate background. Bridget has worked in both corporations and been a small business owner herself. We don't need to tell the business people what to do. We need to be there as an asset for them. And as they determine what they need to do, then determine if we can be helpful to them in that process, whether it's a direct financial, whether it's cutting through some of the red tape, whether it's redefining whether business A or business B falls under phase two or phase three. And there's questions like that all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I, th I think we'll be able to be helpful to them depending on the type of help they need. Some of it may be financial. And if we get a green light, either from the state or the feds on some of these things, then we're certainly going to try to be an active partner for them. So, so with that, I want to thank you all for your time, uh, for being with us. If you want to reach out to us subsequent to this, clarify any point, we're happy to do it. Uh, stay safe out there. Sorry we had to actually drag in today, but we thought this was important enough to do that. And uh, absent that, we'll be on Zoom uh, for the future updates and go from there. Thank you all very much. Have a good day.